Okay, everyone, um, come in, take your respective um, virtual seats. We will start in just a moment. Okay, so as you're all coming in, um, if I'm just going to run you through um, the basics of Zoom. I'm imagining that most of you have been in Zoom before, but those of you who are not familiar with the software, if you'll take your mouse and hover over your screen, you'll see that at the bottom, you have the ability to click on chat um, and give us a, a comment. And there's also a re reactions button where you can um, tell us that you want to raise your hand if you have a question or something like that, or you want to, to comment. Um, so the first thing I'd love for you to do is in the chat, please state your name and the state that you are from. Um, and that will let us know that you know how to use the chat because we will be interacting with you um, on the chat as well as um, doing so via verbal. Cool. People are starting to post things in the chat. That is great. That's exactly what we wanna see. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to let you know is that we're recording this so that your colleagues who aren't able to um, attend this can view it later. Um, there are a few ground rules uh, for this meeting. Number one, um, obviously our goal with this meeting is for us to get some constructive information on how to move forward with editing in legislatures. And so what we're looking for is um, to build solutions. So we, we will um, ask questions that will elicit some problems you may have, have hit along the way, but rather than focusing on problems, what we wanna do is focus on ways to solve problems. So please try to, try to look for the solutions that you've come up with to share with one another. Um, because there's bound to be something that you have come up with that your colleagues in this group here would really benefit from. And we really want to learn from one another. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our um, chair for this meeting, our, our, our host, if you will. That is Wendy Jackson. Um, Wendy is with the Wisconsin legislature. She is um, the the chief of all, all editors, if you will. She, she manages a, a big team of editors and went through many of the same things that you have gone through in your legislatures, um, obviously. And so we um, are delighted that she was willing to act as our moderator. And she's going to be asking you some questions and we'll be asking you some polling questions as well. Um, and we hope that you will all join in and get involved and um, answer lots of things and, and ask lots of things. So with that, Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you, thanks. Um, thank you, Kay. It's so cool that we can all do this and get together like this. It's one thing we have learned, I would say. Um, lovely to see you and it is my honor to serve as the moderator for this roundtable discussion about the current editing odyssey in which we find ourselves. As Kay said, we're here today to talk about what we've learned as editors for legislatures after what feels like a long wandering through 2020 and now three seasons into 2021 because of the pandemic. Many of us experienced big changes and stressful uncertainties and we're part of editing teams that very quickly adapted to telecommuting. Some of us are still figuring things out while others have put strong and efficient remote systems in place or have found new ways to use already established remote friendly systems. Some changes are permanent while others are temporary. And we scheduled this discussion because we think it will be helpful for us all talk, to talk about our shared yet unique experiences. In places like Cambodia and Thailand and possibly on TikTok, I should ask my kids, the phrase is same, same, but different. Um, so we can use this hour to talk about what is same, same, but different in how we're doing our jobs this legislative session. We can share challenges, offer solutions, ask questions and make important connections. Um, and for me, the connections are so important because 
Um, how long have I been doing this, Kate? It's been a long time since I've been involved with RELAX and before that, the legal services staff section. Um, and my connections like you are what um, sometimes the best part of my job. And it's so nice to have, to be able, you know, you come up against something that you haven't come across in your own legislature and you can reach out to someone um, and say, hey, have you come across this? Um, what are you doing? So I hope that you can um, establish connections by participating in this roundtable. Um, this hour is yours and we want you to talk and I'm not afraid to call on people, um, but it should be fun and easy. So um, welcome again. And to get us going, Kay is gonna launch a poll to see what interests you most. So please choose one issue for legislative editors that you would like to discuss today, whether that's remote work, work processes, workflow solutions, tracking the work process or product quality control and training new editors. I'll do mine too. And we'll just wait a second to tally those results. They're coming in pretty fast, so I'm just going to give you a second more. Okay. Sounds good. Right. So it looks like lots of people would like to talk with work about work processes. So I think we'll start with that. And then we could move to um, quality control, it looks like. Um, and just to plant a bug, um, if we get a lot out of our session right now, um, we could talk when we're finished about um, scheduling another one to maybe cover some of these other things that we don't get to. Um, we'll just see how that goes. So um, let's jump in and talk about work processes. And now it's your turn to share your challenges and solutions related to work processes. Um, would anyone want to jump in and describe um, a challenge you faced um, as we entered the pandemic in March of 2020? I mean, here we are now in August of 2021 and talk about challenges you faced um, regarding your work processes as legislative editors. We have Kevin Caldwell with his hand up. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, so I'm from Maryland and we, um, experienced quite a challenge in going from doing everything on paper to doing work remotely being via Teams and um, online editing. Um, so our usual processes involved working on site in pairs with paper documents and we had to quickly learn digital editing and we had to train our staff on how to use Microsoft Teams, um, how to mark up documents in Microsoft Word, um, and we shifted from using the physical code books of the annotated code to using the online versions in LexisNexis. Um, and also in the interim, we've moved some of our uh, team tasks, uh, pairs tasks to uh, working solo. Um, <clears throat> we also, during this past session, 2021, we uh, had to work re remotely, both from home and from various other places in the legislative complex, in addition to some people in our editing office to comply with our social distancing protocols. Um, one thing we did was we digitized a lot of our um, resource materials, um, check sheet checklists and um, reference materials so that we could work off site and have less contact with paper. <clears throat> this, um, this all presented challenges to the way we had successfully done our job before. Um, I think most of us embraced these changes um, and made them work. Um, uh, some of us, of course, had some hesitancy um, 
but I, I think for the most part, it all worked. Um, our, um, our IT uh, staff uh, ad adapted some of our systems uh, so that we could work remotely, especially our ability to pull up the um, online versions of the legislative requests and the bills um, <clears throat> uh, so that we could work on those remotely. Um, and also we were given access to the online amendment editing system so that we could work on amendments remotely. Um, let's see. Um, then of course, in this summer, we've temporarily reverted back to paper for certain things that we still haven't figured out how to do remotely and online. Like what we're working on right now is the proof sheets for the physical books. Um, we're currently doing that on paper. Um, let's see what else I could mention. Um, some of the negatives we encountered were the steep learning curve. There were certain tasks that were hard to do on a computer screen, like checking cross references within a long document. Um, you have to scroll up and down in the document instead of just flipping through pages. Um, and also we had some problems with working on amendments to amendments because we, we, we had to find the right document that we were amending. And that was not always easy, especially if you only had one monitor. Some of the positives were the ability to work from home. Um, we learned that communication on Teams was vital. It was useful to have a written record of instructions instead of um, oral announcements in the room. And if, particularly with amendments, we found that it, the online system for working on amendments made things a lot faster <clears throat> in some ways because we didn't have to have several iterations of a document going back and forth between the editors and the typists who made the corrections. Um, and I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about on our changes to our processes. If anybody else has any questions. Uh, someone asked a question, what programs do you use for your documents? Um, we're pr primarily um, MS Word. We don't have a proprietary system for the documents themselves. Um, some documents, of course, get converted into PDFs. Um, and Kevin, you mentioned um, the way you're communicating is using Microsoft Teams. Is that right? Yes. And I think a lot of offices have gone to um, using communication platforms like that. I know um, we in Wisconsin, um, we're now using Slack. Is anyone else using Slack? Um, which is really nice. And those of you um, on the line from Wisconsin, you can chime in. I think um, one of the biggest challenges right away was how do you communicate with your team? And editors are collaborative people. Um, and we're used to um, just piling into someone's office and working through questions. Um, and then we have this cool um, Slack set up, but then that can also be overwhelming if it's constantly dinging at you um, and you're trying to get work done. Um, so one thing that came out of talking to Marilyn's staff earlier as we were talking about this roundtable, um, which I hadn't really thought about, but one thing that really helps that I wanted to share is that on Slack, you can set up the channel. So we have one that's set up um, specifically for the editors and we call it the Hive. Um, I've mentioned it before. Um, and it's a private channel, not even um, the chief or um, um, vice, what is she called again? We call her Kathleen. Neither of them is allowed on the hive. And this is where we collaborate. Um, we also, you know, we provide lighthearted um, clips sometimes and we support each other just like we did in the office. I mean, it's, it's not the same as being in the office, but it is, it's working really well, I think. Um, and then we have other channels. One is set up for the LRB only and 
That is where um, the chief does communicate with the entire agency. It's reserved for basically um, like serious questions, like no joking around, um, important information that we all need to hear, things like that. And then we do have a channel called Picks and Gifts and um, what is it? It's a, but that's where you can post pictures of your pets and, you know, um, talk about other things going on in our community. And then, and this is something that I'm kind of proud of, but we have a channel called Comma Drama. And this is set up for primarily attorneys, but some research analysts too, who are authors of um, research papers and memos, they can ask the editors questions because as I said, the Hive is a private channel for us. But this is where they can post their questions and we take turns um, coming up with solutions. So I wanted to share that. Um, does anyone have anything to add to what either Kevin said um, about how they set out or what I'm talking about with communication um, or ask questions or add to that? Uh, Wendy, we have um, a comment question um, from the chat from Ben Hawkins. He says, um, sorry for spamming the chat. I don't currently have access to a camera and mic. That's not a problem, Ben. Um, but he wants to know how are folks who use MS Word uh, as the container for their drafting tools, differentiating tracked changes between different users, um, for example, a drafting attorney and an editor? Um, well, in Maryland's case, the documents, <clears throat> first of all, there's different versions of the document, and so they get different names and depending on what stage they're in. Um, also, the changes are tr that are tracked have the name attached to the change or to a comment. Um, Doran, do you want to answer um, Ben's question as well? Well, I can read that too, um, and most people can see this, but Doran says that they save each revision as a separate file and have a script to automate the numbering of the file versions. Um, and speaking of versioning, and Mimi from Maryland and I were discussing the importance of versioning. And in Wisconsin, we're, we were really lucky because um, we were not doing anything remotely. Um, we were very heavy paper and pen but we realized that we have a sophisticated proprietary bill drafting system that helped us. Um, to made, we are very strict and versioning is really important. Um, it was before the pandemic, but working from home, it just became crucial um, because in the past, the way we could tell versioning is that the attorney would bring in the drafting file, the paper file that would track along the electronic system and that's what would trigger everything we would um we had baskets and maybe you all had baskets for paper um, before and we had all the baskets were labeled with a day of the week and then there was the basket labeled now and i know all of you know what i mean about that mm -hmm. and in that basket nothing really even hits the table because we're on it immediately um, but it was that paper that triggered everything and the paper we could tell what version we're working on. Um, we have different, we number our preliminary versions and then um, we also number our introducible versions, but that's how we could tell. Um, all along, we could tell by looking in the system, but we had never utilized it in that way. Um, so now for our versioning, um, we are, you might be horrified, but we're allowing our attorneys to type directly into a draft, into a new version of the draft. And we're using, a, I think some of you call it a read against tool, but we have a very sophisticated compare tool. So we're taking that new version and taking the most, the next, um, the previous version and comparing those two versions and that produces a new document. Um, and we can tell, we call it the diff doc and we can see um, what changes there are and what needs to be editing, edited rather. Um, so we're not using Word. Um, so I guess I'm answering the question for um, what we're doing in Wisconsin, but does someone else wanna talk about um, if you have something that your IT, and 
by the way, thank goodness for all of our IT offices. Oh my goodness. Um, but does someone else want to share um, if they have a different system they're using for versioning um, or for like in where it's tracking changes? Um, but does well, and Doran is available to talk now. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, as I mentioned in my post, we just uh, have a numbering system and it's uh, fairly easy to uh, determine who issued a particular draft uh, based on the number. Um, another thing that we do with uh, rewrites, if for instance, an attorney has drafted something and it's gone to an editor or proofreader and then is sent back for additional changes, uh, the attorneys will uh, manually uh, render their changes in a colored text so that the proofreader knows only what portions have been changed and what they need to proofread. I think one challenge of using Word, um, does that in Wisconsin, and I think many states use striking and scoring to show changes to, um, to current law. And so um, we do use the track changes in Word to work on memos and research publications, but we don't use it for bill drafting um, because of the striking and scoring issue. And Wendy, uh, Patricia Egan has some information. Patricia, do you want to unmute and talk? Um, I was just um, commenting on what Wendy had said about the compared document. Um, in Connecticut, we do something similar, but we do use Word. We just use um, the numbered document, which is a previous edited version, and compare that to what the um, attorney submitted with their changes in it. And those will show up and then are edited. And then that document, the compared one, gets saved manually um, in a database that we have at, that's accessible to the secretaries who um, handle the proofreading. And so the, the attorneys will then receive their current draft as well as the document with the compared documents so they can also see the changes. Um, that, that worked really well for us. Thank you. Um, so Sarah Reed has a question. Um, she asks, how does the electronic versioning comply with maintaining historical records and satisfying legal archival requirements? It's a great question. I can talk about what we do in Wisconsin, but I don't want to take up all the oxygen. Does someone else want to talk about how um, they maintain um, statutory requirements for bill drafts? Well, I'll share what we do. In our statutes, we are we have our drafting files are open to after they have been introduced, um, but there is no that is per statute. There's no statutory requirement that we need to maintain the drafting file with paper. Um, and fortunately, we had started a paperless initiative before March of 2020, um, and we had a paperless team talking about how we can move from using so much paper to um, putting this all in a digital file. And our program assistants have been vital in helping us maintain our drafting files. Um, so we no longer have file cabinets full of current session drafting files and past session drafting files. And you know, we have a storage room with you know, countless um, legislative sessions full of drafting files, um, but we're not required to keep it in paper. We are keeping it online. We do post that um, at the end of each session. Wendy Mimi has her hand raised. Great. So I, um, I'm a little squirrely about not having um, a paper record. 
Um, we've always had, um, you know, uh, previous years documents where we could actually go back and look if there was a mistake made, when was it made, who made it, um, was it valid, um, is it, was there, and I, I still, I have an issue, I, I thought that was so much easier, um, and I'm not sure if I understand, um, guys from Maryland, um, help me out if, if you can, I'm not sure what happens to our archived files that are not archived anymore. Um, I just, uh, um, I'm a little worried about that and always have been, but um, I need um, something tangible. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll let someone else chime in too, but I agree with you, Mimi, that that's one thing I miss about not being able to go track down the paper file and not to call people out, but when something does go wrong, you want to know how did that happen? When did this, when did this, when was the error introduced? and using it as a teaching moment, um, but also a little bit of CYA, because it's not always us um, who introduces an error. Um, yeah. Anyone else on that? With There are two um, questions in the chat I can turn to. Um, one from Matt, do people in other states use text compare tools to edit? And can anyone talk about the way they use it? I can tell you how ours work. <laughs> As I mentioned, our the diff doc that we have, um, when we export the current version of a draft and the previous version of a draft, and we run a routine um, that compares, it is a text and it also looks at striking and scoring. We can also use the compare to, compare to the current statutes to make sure that we're working with the most accurate version of any statutory unit. Um, and this diff doc that I'm talking about and maybe someone from Wisconsin can attest, it's not very intuitive um, to read it, um, but once you get used to um, how the changes are shown, it goes along pretty quickly. Um, and it depends, in fact, on what document you have to the above and to the left on your desktop, what you're comparing to what. Um, so depending on that, and without getting into the weeds too far, if there's red um, Roman text, that is usually an insertion, and big blue italics text is a deletion. And then you can comb through that um, and to see what needs to be edited. I think it might look a lot like comparing two um, documents in Word where there's redlining um, which we do use for, I have at least for memos and um, research publications. We have some comments from A. Cooper. Okay. Can you unmute and, and talk to us? Yes. Um, the, the only thing I was going to say as far as versioning goes, we have had the same concerns about making sure that everything we have done, whether on paper or electronic is being tracked. Currently our bill drafting system tracks every change that's being made. All of our overstrike is in green, our underscore is in red. But if you hover over that language, you can see who made the change in the system. So whether it's the drafter, the attorney, the second header, the editor, the support staff person, every per, every mark is date and time timestamped. Mm -hmm. When that document is saved, every person who saves it, the system is versioning it. So we actually have the ability to go in and pull up every single save and see every single change that was ever made. However, when we proofread, uh, we do that in teams of two, um, most of the time it's on paper. If we're doing it electronically, we have issued all of our staff iPads, the bigger ones that are the size of a piece of paper. We all have Apple pencils and you can write on there just like you were writing on a piece of paper. 
what happens then is you just simply open up your computer, share file, different methods of transferring the files. And we attach that to the systems work request, as we call it. But that way we can see all of our handwritten changes as well in order to track what changes exactly are being made. And the reason for that is if a change is being made where we accept changes, as we call it, some of our changes may actually disappear. The only way to truly track those changes would be to mark it on paper. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What is your state? North Dakota. North Dakota, okay. I see people talking about WordPerfect, which I'm dying to talk about. But before that, um, Jamie Shanks, who is our immediate past chair of RELAX and led us with great leadership through this, um, these last um, 18 months, said she can weigh in on what Tennessee is doing. Hi. Um, so we don't really have editing staff necessarily we have proofreaders in Tennessee but basically for say bills and resolutions well I'll talk about bills um, attorneys draft and then attorneys edit and then it goes to proof and then there is a final attorney doing some more edits so that's kind of how we're dealing with it uh, we were all paper and then we switched like I'm sure a lot of people did to doing it for um, completely um, through systems and virtually and we had to make some, uh, our tech people um, edited the current drafting system that we have and to see the changes that are made along the way. We have um, an actions bar pretty much and it goes from one person to the next. So you insert the next person in and then every time they get finished and it moves to the next person, it saves a draft. And that draft is a linked on the um, the drafting program. So like I can look at a bill that was drafted and I know who was the drafter and I can look at their a version that they sent through the system. I can look at who reviewed it, the other attorney that reviewed it and see what they marked up and so on and so forth. And then if I wanna compare like how it looked in the beginning to how it came out the end, what I what I personally would do is I would have to click on the link and save those. And we, our program utilizes Word. So I would save the two different versions I'm trying to compare and contrast and just compare and contrast them through the Word feature that's in that program itself. But we can actually go through and you open it up on any bill in our program and it'll show who, who all touched the document. It'll show, it'll have a link to what the version looked like as they touched it. And every time, say, I draft something and it goes to the next attorney to edit, their edits will show up when it comes back to me in the usual red line version that um, Word, the Word program has. Thanks for sharing that, Jamie. Um, Christy in Colorado, do you want to talk about WordPerfect? And man, do I ever miss WordPerfect. <clears throat> I'm not sure if anybody, uh, well, there's probably some folks on here who've never even heard of it. It's so antiquated. Yeah, I just dated myself. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Um, so I, I can't really explain why we still use it other than in a nutshell, we need to see revealed co reveal codes. And so um, it's all related to us having our own database for all the statutes because we work with LexisNexis who's essentially printing our publication that we create in-house for the statute. So it, it's all related to that. We're working on a multi-year project to create our own word processing system ultimately, but it's years in the works. So in the meantime, we are using WordPerfect. And so there's, I do believe there's some sort of track changes component there, but we could never get it to work and manipulate it the way we wanted um, for ease for drafters, for editors, for revisers. And we do have a system where we have attorney drafters, we have uh, non-attorney editors who edit each bill draft, and then we have another attorney revising as well. Um, 
So what we developed through Word Perfect, and we think thankfully have a very well versed IT uh, staff member who, you know, like someone else said, I mean, we can't say enough great things about the IT support we have received. Um, particularly from our hero, Wade Harrell, just shout out to him. I know he's not on, but anyway, Wade helped us develop different macros to automate a lot of the systems for electronic editing. Because yes, pre-pandemic, um, pre we were all paper. We tracked everything on the hard copy of every document and then had the electronic version following along and keeping up with that. Um, so um, we developed a system where um, editors use one color-coded um, highlighted text for their changes. We also have a macro that allows them to, to um, automate a comment so that um, it, it has a, a special code that's, that asks the drafter, do you accept this change? Do you reject it? Or do you have a, an explanation or comment you want to make about it? And then we have the same sort of process for the revisers to use a different color text, highlighted text um, for their comments. And then the drafters can comment back with a different color text. And then we have a macro that will wipe out all of that coding um, once the bill has gone through and been proofed and corrected so you can have a clean version at the end. It's kind of, it doesn't sound nearly as um, easy, as simple. I mean, all of this has been a challenge, I think, for anybody who wasn't doing this process electronically to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so we've all had a big learning curve in that regard, I'm sure. Um, I still do like to, when I can, print off a draft and read it. It's, it's particularly challenging uh, to look for internal references and things like that. Um, we did make sure that everyone has two screens at home to try to make that a little easier. Um, but it, it's uh, it's working. Is it the most efficient? Probably not. And so we, you know, hopefully our word processing system can change and become more adept in the future, but for now, that's that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. Well, let us know. Um, <laughs> and and one thing, I'm questions. curious how other people did this. If I could just ask a question. Um, somebody else alluded to this or talked about the fact that they have, you know, paper inboxes, basically, your work, your um, in basket of, of work that needs to be edited. And we had a, a physical box um, with different slots for different days, similar to what I heard. And uh, plus our, ours is called ASAP instead of now, but it's the same <laughs> concept. Yeah. Um, is it really an ASAP? If not, don't put it there. Um, so mm -hmm. we had to create basically a virtual inbox which actually we all love now because we can all see, I'm the team leader on my team. I can now see what everyone is working on at any time, not to micromanage it, but just to be able to see and get a sense and see, oh gosh, this person has a ton of work or we might need to reallocate, things like that. But I, I'm curious to know what other people have done in terms of helping track what work needs to be done. Does anyone wanna jump in? Matt? Yeah, I just, um, the way we, we had our IT um, create, um, is we call, I call it a queue, um, and it's just a big list of um, uh, the, the bill numbers um, um, that you can, with columns, and you can just sort through it. So if you're looking for, um, you can sort it by priority. So if it's like a, an ASAP or now, we call them rushes. Um, you could sort by that and see, you know, if, if that needs to be done first. Um, uh, each each little um, bill if, if you had the number um, like a hyperlink. So if you click the the bill number, it would open in another of our programs where you could actually click and open up the document itself. Um, it's also that's also the program we use to to see the different versions um, of that particular bill. Um, so that 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 queue was pretty helpful for you can see like everything that's coming coming through. Um, and um, the sorting was really helpful. And you could even sort by like what stage the document was in, if it's brand new, um, if it needs a second read or if it was in a correction, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just, it was, it was a, seems like a, I, I mean, I'm not a coder or anything, but it seems like an easy thing to create. It's just a big list that pulls in every time a, a bill was logged into the system as needing 
to be read. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. just pop into that list. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. Alec? Hi, thank you. Um, we sort of set up um, for tracking jobs and stuff that was coming in uh, for the three editors, sort of a what we call a virtual whiteboard, which was really just an Excel spreadsheet that um, you know the group can edit. But uh, usually when jobs came in via email, um, someone else, not one of the editors, would put all the information up on the board as, as far as what the document number was in our document management management system when it came in, um, when the attorney wanted it back, and then they would assign it. And then after it was assigned, they track when it came in and then when it went back to the attorney. And uh, that was really helpful for us to, as uh, others have said, to sort of keep an eye on who's doing what, what we have still left to do, what's been done and what the priorities are. Um, also the attorneys, uh, we opened it up, the attorneys could look at it. So if they were working on something, they could see what our workload was like to see you know, how they needed to manage um, the work when they needed to get it in, to get it done mm -hmm. uh, on their time schedule. So that was really helpful. Plus it, which we'd never had before, it really gave us a way say at the end of each month to take a look at what is the workload, what type of documents have we had, what's the number, which uh, to I think uh, people who were not in our department was really kind of an eye opener when they saw the number of documents that actually go through. Thank you, Alec. Mimi, did you wanna add something? Well, I was just piggybacking off of what Matt said and we, we can pretty much um, we know who has what document at what time because there are many instances where um, you're reading something and it's really long and halfway through they cancel it. So we need to tell um, our editors to stop so we can look up, we can put in the legislative request number, the bill number, find out who has it and then quickly you know, throw them a chat and tell them to stop or this has now become a rush. So um, having that tagged on to the queue um, really is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have something similar in Wisconsin. Um, and I want to go back to what Christy asked about, you know, um, when you how do you know something's a now or a rush or urgent? We had our IT people build in when and the attorneys have an inbox, the researchers have an inbox and the editors have an inbox, as well as the program assistants who do the submitting. Um, but our IT staff built us um, a way for attorneys to put a red exclamation point on any um, particular draft. So when it is forwarded to the editor's inbox, we can see um, that that is a now. And someone said, you know, is it like a a real now? Is it a soft now? Um, I mean, we, we take it for, for what it is. Um, and that's been really helpful. And we can also mark something with the red exclamation point as urgent for the program assistants if they're waiting for something on the floor, um, something like this. Um, so that's been really great. And then I also, in system, I can see what Mimi's describing. Um, I can see where every where everything is. Um, and I can see if someone needs help or very often we have a shifting deadline. I'm sure that never happens with anyone else. Um, then you have to go find something um, to do it. And I, I think this, um, this affects like people who are editing research documents as well and not just bill drafting. Um, so I wanted to, I don't see, I see Patricia has her hand up. Um, so why don't, Patricia, why don't you go ahead and chime in? I, I was just gonna um, add to what you were saying. Um, in Connecticut, we have a similar system as Wisconsin. Um, in my inbox, um, I have, I, I will receive a document. The attorney has the capability when submitting to um, specify what time they need it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be within a four hour window or if they choose not to do a time, then the default would be 24 hours. So if I see a document that's 24 hours, I know it's not a rush, but that we, we also have that exclamation feature 
And we also have what we call a go. So if it's a go, we know we have to push it through very quickly. Um, there's also, and this is something that inbox was developed by our IT department um, specifically for the technical review editing and editing process. Um, there's also a field in there where you can, the attorney can leave notes for the editor and the editor could leave notes for the secretary. So they can see it, um, what needs to be done, how quickly it needs to be done. And of course, everything could change on a dime, but that's how it begins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to, um, Lisa mentioned that, you know, we've been talking a lot about bill drafting and we do have research editors. I'm one, um, all of our Wisconsin editors also do research editing and we're learning from states um, like Kentucky, for example, how to, how to do it. Um, um, so does anyone want to talk about um, what you have, what is the challenge, um, what you've implemented in terms of versioning or comparing for research documents? I see you, Brian Throckmorton. or Erica, our the new vice chair of RELAX is in the room with us. We're very happy to see you. Okay. Brian says he doesn't have a working mic. Oh, okay, fair enough. And I'll just say, um, like for our, we had already been doing all of our um, editing for research publications and our memos using Word and very rarely any paper unless an editor wanted to print something out for some reason. So we had a system in place where we were using track changes. Um, and then the author is responsible for clearing out all the track changes, clearing out unresolved issues and then sending clean copy to the requester. Any more about that? Let's see, looking through the chat. Um, Doran has a question for the group. Um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to answer that. For those offices with an electronic digital inbox, do you have mandatory requirements for the format of the source document. Um, for example, all bills from outside sources must be in Word or WordPerfect or Google Docs. Um, do you have trouble enforcing these standards? Does, I know um, we do not, we have, um, our system is set for a specific type of document, but for those of you, I know Delaware, um, don't you have outside drafters? Um, can anyone answer this question for Doran? Sarah, can you unmute and talk? That's a great comment. Oh, we just, our process is uh, heavily paper in any case, but we take bill requests um, electronically by email. Um, we take uh, drafts from other offices, um, basically in any format that we can get. Um, and they're converted by our technicians um, wow. who enter the documents. Um, everything though is done, is kept, maintained, and um, the in folders. We transfer everything in paper folders. When we were working remotely, uh, we were scanning documents to people who weren't in the office, but someone in the office had the paper that was going to end up in the folder and was making the changes that were going to be kept. I think in some ways the accountability of, of documentation that you get with paper, with hard copies, is hard to give up. As someone else remarked, being able not only to, to to figure out where an error happened, but how much of a change was deliberate? 
who who decided that this language was was um, uh, preferable, particularly when there are ambiguities that arise. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, <laughs> although I've, I have found that there are, we, we have, um, our tracking is electronic. We've had a great tracking system for years that was designed by our IT department. So things are tracked both in as bill requests and as the documents as they're produced. Um, and we can always call up the current version and print it out and scan it and send it. Um, but uh, we always know who wrote what when. And I think that is, uh, I, I, I'm a bit of a Luddite, I suppose, in not wanting to lose that, but I do think there are legal implications. Mm -hmm. I agree. How, do, how well do cocktail napkins hold up in a drafting file that gets archived? <laughs> well, you'd have to talk to the archivist about that. <laughs> as long as you can scan it or take a picture. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Jamie, did you wanna say something? Sure, uh, again, for Tennessee, I don't think we have a policy on it because like everyone else was saying, we take them however we can get them if they're written on napkins or if we take them by phone call or whatever. We have been encouraging members in more recent years to submit via email. So if there is, if so if they have either drafted or more than likely someone's given them pre drafted language, then they'll forward it to us. Uh, for me personally, when I get something like that that's in a PDF form or uh, a member has physically dropped off um, a hard copy that's clearly been typed up somewhere, I will call their assistant and ask for them to um, get with whoever gave that to them and have them send us a word, send it to us in Word since our drafting system works off a of Word just because it's quicker and it would save um, an assistant up here who's already busy from having to type it up and you know if they're typing it up and they miss a word then that can make all the difference in the world and you might not notice it so uh, as personally if i get something like that i will contact the member's office and ask them if they can find out if there's a word version because if someone's typed something up somebody's got it on their computer somewhere and it's usually in word and uh, Angela, did you want to say something? I wanted to ask a question about workflow, if that's okay. Yes, please do. It sounds like some of you may uh, receive your files to work on through email, and that's what we've been doing throughout the pandemic. All files are submitted to a central proofreading inbox. Uh, if anyone else uses that system, how do you divide up the work? How do you manage the workflow? We've had a problem with multiple people taking files at the same time, and also with people accidentally deleting files from the inbox. Mm. And I wonder if any of you have any experience with those kinds of issues. Does anyone want to answer the question? You know I have an answer, so. Matt? Um, yeah, so we, we had a similar, I, I talked before about the queue that we have, um, where if you click the, the bill number, it takes you to the other program. Um, so we, this was part of the growing pains thing about you know, learning what works for us. Um, so the, early on we had um, people, you know, opening the same document. Um, we, there is like a, a protection to it, like only one person can open the document at a time. So um, there was that sort of protection, um, but we learned to, we have a, also have a logging system that um, it was also linked to this queue. So once that bill was logged out, it would be removed from the queue until we logged it back in after we were done reading it. Um, so we learned to open the document first before logging it because that would lock it to whoever was gonna read it and then log it. Um, so that was kind of our safety net thing. Um, but we did early on have people, um, you know, opening it up and starting to read it without really, yeah, you know, and somebody else also working on it at the same time. Um, and there was some confusion there until we sort of implemented that rule to open it first and save it and then log it. So it would be removed from the queue. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Anyone else? I can tell you that um, as part of our inboxes, um, each editor can acquire a draft electronically. We were using this before we went paperless, um, just even though the drafting the paper file would follow the digital file. But you know, every once in a while, someone will come in and say, who has this one? And so we were always encouraging editors to acquire a draft, both for um, it was not, it wouldn't have happened before with paper for someone to be working on the same draft at the same time. So this is critical for us now to acquire the digital file. And so I can see that Chris has um, this acquired if someone asks me about it. And then in that way, no one can work on it at the same time. I will say that our program assistants every now and then have, um, they do the submitting to the requesters across the street at the Capitol and they have had to work out um, not submitting the same, two people submitting the draft at the same time. And that has been a challenge um, with no paper file to trigger those routines. Does anyone else wanna say something about that? Um, well, we are three minutes. Kay said that um, we can run over if people want to, um, but given that we had a choice of talking about seven different things, um, and we've really had a great conversation just about work processes, and I feel like we could talk more about this. Um, if people are interested in convening another roundtable, um, for editors, both research editors and um, bill drafter editors, um, you could post a topic in the chat. I think there's a way that, um, like Holly just said, please tell us if you'd like to get this group together again and topics you would want to discuss. I think that would help us for planning. Um, also, if anyone is interested in moderating one of these conversations, it's fun and easy, and I would encourage you all to do it. Um, and then just backing up, um, if you want to go ahead and um, tell us some topics, but Ben asked, I don't know if anyone else has this ability, but was the ability for an attorney to digitally mark up a previously processed document? Ben, do you wanna talk about um, this a little bit? in the couple minutes we have left. Oh, that's no problem. I guess I'm not visualizing that very well. Yeah, so you can see the new changes. Okay. Kate, what else do you want? What, what would you like to do with our time remaining? Okay, uh, well, um, we have a lot of, of comments and questions um, that have come in in the chat. Um, and um, for those of you who participated, I'll do my best to um, type those up um, and send them out um, to all of you. Um, for those of you who didn't see the some of these answers in the chat, um, does anyone else have, any, have a question? I know, um, Angela had her hand up a minute ago. Do you want to talk, Angela, before we um, before we close? Because that would give us a chance to cover one more question before we move on. Yes, if you don't mind me asking one more question. Yes. Um, I haven't heard anyone mention this, and this is not necessarily the most efficient system, but we currently, our documents come in in WordPerfect, but um, we mark our proofreading changes and all subsequent changes after the initial draft on PDFs using comment tools. And then our word processors uh, follow those comments and make the changes that are noted. Um, because we use WordPerfect and the track changes feature doesn't work properly, as someone did mention. Um, does anyone else use uh, PDF comment tools, I'm wondering? And if that worked for you, or if you would say that it does not work. We've had a lot of internal discussions about changing it, but we don't have a lot of options right now. Mm -hmm. 
We do, but I'd love to give someone else an opportunity to talk about it if you're using PDF markup. This is Christy from Colorado. Um, I will say that we looked at trying to use PDF markup and um, this was last summer, I guess. We had um, taken a, I think maybe it was after we had finished the 2020 session. We were, we had, you know, managed to muddle through the last three weeks of that session after we came back from the pandemic break. Um, we looked at trying to do the PDF markup and <laughs> There was so much um, techno new technology burnout from everyone that we just thought the learning curve to learn this new process when we had already kind of muddled through making edits and revisions in WordPerfect, we figured we'd fine tune that process rather than look at the PDF. Um, but I'd be curious to know, um, uh, Angela, I think, it was you who talked about this, um, how it is working for you, because we are certainly open to um, figuring out ways to create more efficiencies. Um, but we also just were concerned about relearning or learning a whole new process that was completely unfamiliar to folks when some people were still trying to get back to speed on WordPerfect, because it is sort of going backwards. Well, I will share. Oh, Angela, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to respond quickly that, um, Christy, since you use WordPerfect as well, if you wanted to have a conversation offline, I would be happy to do that sometime. Um, but I'll just quickly say that opinions vary on whether the uh, PDF markup is working. I say that it is. I mean, not as well as having a track changes feature, but I say given that what we have, it's working. But we have one or two drafters who just cannot stand marking the changes, even if they know how to do it. I've had training <laughs> sessions with individual drafters for the past year and a half, and uh, have most of them are really good and really fast and they like it. But one or two drafters really hate it and are causing some uh, challenges for me. Mm. So it, it, it basically works, but not everyone agrees. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to talk offline with anyone about this too. Um, I think we've had a positive experience about using the PDF markup. I think we could um, meet, we haven't, we just haven't had time to kind of take a breath and um, review how we are marking up PDFs. Um, but I did, I would point you to um, the Chicago manual style. Section 2.133 has a nice, um, section about ways to mark up a PDF and other similar um, files, um, much as you would with paper and pen, and it's probably um, too much to go into right now, um, but talks about how to be efficient um, and how you would always um, provide markup as an overlay and you would never undo what an author has done. Um, and we could talk a lot more about that. So I'm, I would, love to get together with Angela and Christy and anyone else who wanted to um, to talk about that. That'd be great. And obviously, um, anyone who wants to get together again, um, we're definitely getting some comments um, that people would like to, to have another meeting. Um, obviously, for those of you uh, who uh, came to this, we have a huge list of, of potential topics as as Wendy mentioned, you know, we, we did the quick survey at the beginning, uh, but we're pretty sure that, that, that this group can, can have a lot to discuss. And there are so many different ways to approach all of these issues. And I think it's useful to get together. And so if, if everyone's interested, um, I'll schedule something. Uh, I don't know, does anybody have a vote on how far out? Do you want me to wait a month? Does that sound about right to get together again? Or do you want to get together sooner? How about um, tomorrow? To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe not tomorrow, um, but uh, even two weeks from now, I might be able to put something together. Um, and so if, if you want something fairly quickly, please let me know. Uh, obviously, you can email me offline and let me know uh, topics that you'd like to talk about as well. But I think this group of people is interested in discussing, and I think you can learn from each other, and, and I'm happy to facilitate this. Mm -hmm. 
And thank you to Kay um, for keeping us together and keeping us going. And thank you to Relax for sponsoring this. Um, it's all good stuff. It just feels like home to see all of you and to have this conversation. Um, in the past, when we had our in-person PDS meetings, we um, normally would work in a roundtable discussion, just like this. Um, and I, as I said, when we started, this is great to be able to do this on Zoom because not everyone can make it to those in-person meetings even when we're having them. Um, so thank you so much for joining us um, and we'll be in touch about the next one. I'm kind of feeling like it won't be tomorrow, uh, but maybe soon. So thank you. Thank you everyone and have a great day.